this i will start on today's lecture let me <coughs> i ended up with defining the tangent space of an analytic manifold m yeah, analytic manifold and for a point m in m i have om is the <coughs> k algebra modeled on the analytic manifold over k i have to specify the field there OM is a K algebra and a tangent vector is a map, linear map, it's a K linear map from OM into K such that V of F G equals V F into G M plus F M into B G. That's the definite tangent vector, and the set of tangent vectors is a vector space denoted. T sub m. <coughs> I'll put an extra m if the if it's not clear what manifold we are working with. We'll introduce that manifold no. <coughs> later here. <coughs> okay. So the vector space denoted m, and last time we also saw that first of all, om is isomorphic the algebra of convergent power series. And this has a notation. The ring algebra convergent power series denoted K curly bracket X would manifold of dimension n. Then this is n variable C. The same as if you like O at the origin in K n. That is the germs of analytic functions at the origin in K. Zero is the origin. So this is the kind of thing I ended up with telling you yesterday. <coughs> now we have the notion of a tangent vector in a for an object like the sphere, for instance. How does this match with that? I won't say it's essentially the same thing. There's no real difference. What you do is you take a take an object like a sphere or more generally the set of zeros of, a fun, of an analytic function from Km to Km on an open set where, where all the, the Jacobian is the right rank. So you take the set of points and the object will look somewhat like the sphere. Locally Euclidean we know that. And then here we know what we mean by tangent from your elementary geometric ideas. So if I take a point M here we are looking for a vector which touches that. But that is same thing as it's touching some curve which lies entirely on M. Suppose, so take a, <coughs> suppose gamma from minus epsilon to plus epsilon into M, this is a manifold if you like, is a C infinity curve. It's, a, it's an analytic curve. No, it's an analytic curve. Oh well, yes, right. Uh, <coughs> Once again, yeah, I have to avoid. Uh, oh, not minus. I shouldn't say okay. Sorry. Right. I Suppose. Uh, 
just a moment. Gamma is x in k mod x less than epsilon. Yeah, it's an analytic curve. We know what an analytic map from this to m is. That has been defined between two manifolds. We know what an analytic map. Suppose this is an analytic curve. I, since I'm taking this k as the first object, open set in k as the first object, I want to call it a curve. In analogy with what happens in the real case. Curve is always one-dimensional. Hmm? Curve, curve is one-dimensional, yeah. So take such a curve and suppose f is an analytic function. Ah, uh, it's an analytic curve with gamma 0 equal to m. Passing through this point m here. If f is an analytic function, then consider d by dt, d by dx, right, of f of gamma of x at x equals 0. Look at this. In fact, take f to analytic function germ. This differentiation makes sense because all that you need this to be defined in a small neighborhood of gamma 0. Okay. And if it's a germ, it's certainly defined in some neighborhood and this makes perfect sense. For the, for the germ, it makes sense, not merely function. A germ is represented by a function defined in the neighborhood and so this makes perfect sense. So this is a derivation. It's a tangent vector. That's clear from Leibniz formula that this is going to be a tangent vector. Because I have given a mapping from germs of analytic functions into back into scalar fields, k. To each f a germ, I have also the scalar. So it's a mapping of OM. So each analytic curve passing through M gives me a tangent vector. And if, you, if two curves are on the same manifold, and suppose they touch each other, in our intuitive sense. Then you see immediately that this dif differentiation gives you, yields the same result, independent of the curve, provided the two curves have the same tangent vector. Okay. This is, if you think of this as so everything happening in Euclidean space, you know when two curves touch each other, when their derivatives all coincide, okay, in every direction, they coincide, and then function of function rule tells you that differentiation along that is simply <coughs> differentiation along various directions multiplied by the derivative of gamma in those directions. That's the way it works. Okay. So it's really the intuitive idea of a tangent vector made abstract. It's not really very different from our usual notion of a tangent vector. Okay, that's one comment I want to make about tangent vectors. And I said, already remarked the set of tangent vectors form a vector space and the dimensions of this vector space, uh, the set of dimension Tm is precisely n. This is, again, this was seen as follows. If uh, we identified OM with the power series, convergent power series ring in n variable section next to xn, Then you see d by dxi at 0 from OM after this identification to k is a tangent vector. And these vectors form a basis. We saw that the tangent vector is completely determined if you know it on the functions x1, xi. If you know it on these functions, you know everything. So that, so it follows that the dimension is at most n, and then but you apply d by dx on the function xj, you land up in delta ij. So from that it's clear it's a basis. And in, in order to identify OM with this identification, is through a coordinate system, through a coordinate chart.
Suppose you take a second coordinate chart. Again, you get an identification of, uh, <coughs> you get two bases. Suppose UF, VG are two charts. And we denote the coordinates by x1, x2, xn and y1, y2, yn respectively. Then all the yi's are analytic functions on the x1, x2, xn and vice versa in the common portion u intersection v. Make a suggestion. Yeah. You could write a little bigger. I will try. And, yeah, I will try. Write, yes. I'll, I'll start, but I'm sure I'll deteriorate. You can, you can pull me up again. Okay, okay. Thanks. <laughs> In fact, yesterday I think it was pretty bad for, awful for people at the back. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay. These are actually much bigger than what I wrote yesterday. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> so what happens here? We have using UF get basis d by dx1, d by dxn of Tm. And similarly, using Vg, you get basis d by dy1, etc. d by d. How do the two things relate with each other? Both are bases, so this basis must be expressible in terms of the other basis. So what happens is d by dy1, yi, if you like, is nothing but sigma dxi by dy, dxj by dyi, d by dxj. <coughs> this is the function of function rule which you come across for partial differentiation. So each xi, xj is a function of yi, or the various yi. I can therefore take partial derivatives. So the differentiation with respect to yi amounts to first differentiating with respect to the xj, and then I differentiate the xj with respect to yi and summing up. And of course, it goes the other way around also. d by dx i is sigma j equal to 1 to n, <coughs> dyj by dx i times d by See, this is nothing but the Jacobian matrix. In other words, this basis is transformed to the other basis through the Jacobian matrix. That's what it amounts. Okay. So the Jacobian matrix has an intrinsic meaning. It's a, if it's a one identification of tangent space, another identification of tangent space. The transformation is precisely the Jacobian matrix. Since you are putting young there, so evaluation. Huh? Atm always, yeah. When I say this. Uh, Get basis of Tm, that means at M. M is 0, huh? M is in the U intersection. Yeah. It's only the common point. These both will function as coordinates, and you can write d by dxi only in the common points. Okay. So I can now reformulate with this in mind, I can now reformulate the implicit function theorem. Let me reformulate it in manifold language, if you like. Theorem. Suppose M, N are analytic manifolds. Of dimension P, Q respectively. And suppose, ah, I should have said something more. If, yeah, let me put, before I state the theorem, I need to say something more. Suppose M, M and N are analytic manifolds, and F M10 is an analytic map. Then you see, you take a point M in M, 
and take its image fm let's call that small n maybe small n is bad because uh, let's just let me keep it as fm then if i take a function defined in the neighborhood of fm i can compose with f and get a function on m in the neighborhood of m small m so that in other words you are going to get a mapping of the germs of analytic functions at fm of n into germs of analytic functions at m of m you get a natural map which is simply composition with f which goes like this u going to u composed with f sorry ragwan at that place i cannot make it bigger So it goes from O F M to O M. Now suppose you have a tangent vector to M at M, which means what's a linear map here. Compose to this, you get a linear map of this. In other words, I've been I'm able to give a map of T M T F M T T F M into T F F M. Get map. Does that this end? get a map from t m tangent space to capital m at small m into the cap the tangent space at fm which i call df the differential of f at m notice that once you know it's a tangent vector here the composite is necessarily a tangent vector the moment so algebra homomorphism after all so that condition for a tangent vector will be satisfied automatically so you really get a map of the tangent space to tangent space which is linear obviously so this is called the differential of f at m okay now <coughs> i can now formulate the implicit function theorem in the language of manifolds if you like suppose f m to n is an analytic map of a manifold of an analytic manifold m in n and suppose further df at the point m from the tangent space at m to tangent space tfm is subjective is on to for every m in m then f inverse of any point say pick a point f inverse p for any p then for any p in n f inverse p is an analytic manifold in a natural fashion it is either empty or of dimension equal to dimension m minus dimension notice that the assumption that this is subjective guarantees that the dimension of n is lower than that of yeah less than or equal to dimension of m <coughs> the dimension of the tangent space is dimension of the manifold so this is just a reformulation to say that the mapping is subjective that tangent mapping is subjective means that some n of the some some dimension n of the vectors in the tangent space will map linearly independently onto the image so that is exactly what we the condition which you impose on the jacobian matrix okay. so let's 
So notice here that, uh, of course, it, it can be empty because uh, the all of n may get into some small portion of m. Some, some all of m may get into a small portion of n. After all, that can happen. So it's either empty or the dimension equal to. <coughs> the empty set is usually given minus infinity as this dimension. So, which is why. <laughs> Okay, this is the simply reformed as the implicit function theorem. There's nothing more. In fact, the theorem tells you more. There, given there exists for every point m in m, there exists a coordinate chart u f u to r p. R of uh, <coughs> dimension of M is M, so we M, that's bad. Uh, say P, say K. P equal to dimension of M. Sorry, K. Oh, K, 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 P. Sorry, K, P, P is the dimension of M such that. Such that u intersection f inverse f p is the set of points the set of points f inverse of uh, sorry. P is dimension and also point. <laughs> oh, I thought M is the point. Where is? Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah. Here. Yeah. And the Q is suppose that for any P in N or for any Q in N. Sorry, can ask you. Is it not? In fact, the following thing is true for every M in M. There is a coordinate. <coughs> chart u f u to k p such that if p is the dimension of u the intersection of u with f inverse f p which is you know I take a point in f p here and take its inverse image of the, the intersection looks like a certain hyperplane in this vector space in an open set in that vector space <coughs> the whole of u maps onto an open subset here I want to say f inverse f p corresponds under this isomorphism to a linear subspace. Notice that linear subspaces are always manifolds and they sit very nicely in the bigger space. And what we are saying is that locally it does happen if you have the correct hypothesis. Basically, if the linear part of f, so to speak, if you have an analytic function, you can talk of the linear part. If you, make, you can make a Taylor expansion, just take the linear part. The linear part says a lot about what's happening. If the linear part is, is in some sense generic, it's the best possible, so to speak, then you are in good shape. It's locally, it behaves as if the function itself is a linear function. Geometrically, the function itself behaves as if it's a linear function. That's what the content of the inverse function theorem is. Okay, I, I did not say anything about the proof. The proof is simply, you as, assume that there's a, suppose if you have an function, then you have an expansion. The, notice the theorem is local. Everything is done locally. So you, you can make a Taylor expansion for both. You have a Taylor, you have your interpolar function, you make a Taylor expansion and <coughs> write down the equation fx y equals 0. You, and then equate coefficients on both sides term by term. And so you get a formal power series and then you have to prove its convergence. It's not difficult. It's something which is standardly done over real or complex variables, you can, this is, the proof goes through verbatim without any difficulty. There is a proof in, uh, there is a very nice proof in, uh, for one variable situation, uh, two, two, two variable situation, there is a nice proof in Karta's book on complex variables. It's called the method of measurements. That proof goes through without any real change. 
except some bookkeeping, you know, because several variables you'll have to be a little careful about indices and things that kind. The same proof goes through. Generally, the idea, what the general idea in many of these proofs using analytic functions is to say that you can reduce, the, you, you can say that you construct a formal solution that is pure algebra. You can equate, equate coefficients on various sides and then you, you have to prove its convergence. And what happens is that the formal solution, if you look at the coefficients, they will all be ma majorized by the coefficients of a certain real problem, similar real prob problem in real variables. They will be majorized by the coefficients and the coefficients will all be positive. That's the situation. And co proving convergence therefore reduces the problem in the real variable case, which you sometimes you can do it by hand, but simply can't. Otherwise, there are some tricks like you know, something essentially things like uh, extracting square root of 1 plus, if you have a power series starting with 1 plus higher order, you know how to extract the square root and things are kind. You can use such methods to handle the real case and then the general case will follow. So there is no real difference in the proofs, when, when it comes to proofs, it all reduces the real variables. That is the so called method of measurements, which will be used not only for the th this theorem, for other theorems which are more state now. So, <coughs> I have defined a tangent space for you and this now, fr from this I want to go on to the next definition, a vector field, an analytic vector field <coughs> on the manifold M is an assignment, <coughs> let me give it a name capital X is an assignment XM in the tangent space to M at M for every M in M such that the following holds. <coughs> if UF is a coordinate chart <coughs> XM equals for every M in, yeah, XM can be written as sigma <coughs> some FIM D by DXI at M in this chart summed over i equal to 1 to n set x m equal to that then f i are analytic of course they are defined only in u because this d by d x i at m depends on the coordinate chart analytic at analytic on So, in Euclidean space, for instance, you have a certain number of vector fields, namely d by dx1, d by dx2, d by x, d by xr. They are all vector fields. At every point, d by dx i makes sense, so they are vector fields. And any other vector field is simply a linear combination with function coefficients, analytic coefficients of the d by dx i. I want to say the same thing, except that on a manifold, you don't have readily available d by dx i. They are available only in a coordinate chart. And in the coordinate chart, I say, that, X, that the vector field X should be written as this combination. So, if you like, X on U equals sigma Fi d by dxi. Fi is analytic functions. When I restrict myself to U, I should be able to write it like this. That's all I'm saying. The vector field, at every point you are given a tangent vector depends nicely on them and the nice dependence is what makes this fi analytic analytic functions that's what i mean so that's an analytic vector field <coughs> for, as i said on our <coughs> rn for instance uh, d by dx are all analytic vector fields and any combination sigma fi d by dx i with fi analytic will be an analytic vector field on the sphere it's a theorem for instance that there is Give any vector field of the sphere 
has to be zero at some point. If the vector field is defined everywhere in the sphere, it has to be zero at some point. That's a theorem in topology. Usually described in some popular books as you cannot comb a porcupine. So <laughs> let's see. <coughs> so what happens is, so if you have a sphere, two sphere for instance, by the way, the, on the three sphere there are non zero, vector fields are everywhere non zero. It's on the two sphere I'm talking about. So you try to build a vector field which depends analytically. If you, somewhere or other it has to be zero. If it's an analytic vector field defined on the whole sphere, it will be zero somewhere or other. This is uh, result to the fact that the Euler Poincare characteristic of the sphere is two, is not zero. It is it's a consequence of it, but that takes us too far out. Anyway, so the main thing I want to talk about is starting with the vector field x, one can find a so called one parameter family of diffeomorphisms morphisms of the manifold in question. Let us let me first look at the following analytic diffeomorphisms. morphisms. Well, I have not said what the diffeomorphisms morphisms is anyway. So if M and N are my analytic manifolds. A map F M to N is an analytic diffeomorphism if F is analytic is a homeomorphism that is it's one one continuous on two and the inverse is continuous <coughs> and then F inverse makes sense and that is also analytic <coughs> then I call it an analytic diffeomorphism And there is a very interesting theorem about vector fields which says the following, which is all important for Z theory as well. And indefinite geometry is a very important theorem. It says the, it's really the existence. It's really the existence theorem for ordinary differential equations, as you will see. <coughs> Suppose X is a vector field. Analytic. And the, unless I say otherwise, all vector fields, functions, and other thing, other objects have to be considered. If, if they can be analytic, they will be considered. They will be analytic. Okay. So suppose X is an analytic vector field on M. Observe that many of the things I am saying will also work for any open set in M, because that is an analytic manifold in its own right. So that's why. Often it's sometimes I may not specify, but I may only be working with an open set in the manifold, not everywhere. Anyway, suppose X is an analytic vector field on M, <coughs> and K is a relatively compact open subset. Then uh, let me call it omega. Omega is relatively compact, open subset. Then there exists delta greater than zero and An analytic map of x in k mod x less than delta cross omega into m 
let me call this phi with the following properties such that phi of 0 omega small omega equals omega for every omega and omega. In other words, if I freeze the first variable as 0, what you get is an identity map of omega to omega. To <coughs> phi t of phi s omega equals phi t plus s omega if uh, t s mod t mod s mod t plus s are all less than delta t plus s in the first yeah, yeah, so here t plus s omega if mod t mod s mod t plus s are all less than delta that is necessary to be able to define this and omega is an omega phi s omega is also an omega you need that to be an omega to not be able to define that some see this can be written in the following fashion I write suppose I write phi t of omega this is the definition is phi of t omega then this equation is like phi t of phi s omega equals phi t plus s omega phi t composed with phi s is phi t plus s that is what this equation amounts to If I define phi t omega in that fashion, so you could you should think of each phi t as a diffeomorphism of omega as a, as a mapping of omega into m. It goes into some open. I won't say something more. Uh, notice that I also say that phi t is an analytic diffeomorphism of omega onto an open set phi t omega I am saying that phi t omega is necessary in an open set and then the mapping from omega to phi t omega given by phi t is an analytic diffeomorphism hmm? sorry no help zero or something on omega no 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 no. no, 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 <coughs> no, the vector field is anything. <coughs> Alright, and then so far I have not said anything to let the vector field I started off with. What do I want here? I want the statement for xf equals at a point omega. So let me write for f in <coughs> om m in omega xf and I apply here is the vector field here is a function I can apply xf at the point m the germ will make sense notice xf is going to be equal to <coughs> d by dt at t equals 0 of f composed with phi t notice that f composed with phi t makes sense because phi t takes omega into m and so long as t is small it makes sense to talk of f composed with phi t because for t small phi t of omega will remain phi t of m will remain in omega because phi 0 is identity phi 0 m is m so phi t m remains in omega for small values and then d by dt is going to make sense d by dt of f composed with phi t makes sense 
at t equal zero is precisely x f. Hmm? Sorry. I'm this is XM. F is an OM. Okay. XMF. Right. Yeah. XM. I the assignment XM. I wrote it as X bracket M. Okay. I will also use the expression X sub M. Okay. Both notations will be used. So differentiating with respect to x is really differentiating along the curve. See, if you take omega and t going to phi t omega, it's a curve which passes through the given <coughs> the point omega and omega. I wrote I was using omega earlier and suddenly switched to maybe I stick to omega. <coughs> okay. So t going to fit omega is a curve. What I'm saying is if I differentiate along that curve, it's the same thing as differentiating with respect to the given vector field. So my vector what I've done is through every point there is a curve with this vector field value as the tangent vector. To every point in M, there is going to be a curve, a nice curve, whose tangent vector is precisely x. And the curve will vary nicely with the point. For every M, there is a phi tm. That's a curve. Defined not everywhere, but in a certain neighborhood of the zero, point zero. So, <coughs> this phi t are called one local one parameter group of local diffeomorphisms. Yeah. Notice that in particular we are going to get phi t composed with phi minus t is going to be phi 0 which is identity. So phi t is almost like a group except that unfortunately phi t is not a map of uh, the whole manifold into itself. It's part of the manifold somewhere else but the composition makes sense in a certain common portion of this if, we, if t and s are sufficiently small and there the composition behaves as if you are adding t and the parameters. The parameters just gathered. The composition corresponds. Suppose the manifold m is compact. Then the phi t will be defined for all points in m for fixed more less than delta. But once it's defined for more less than delta, you can, in the real case, suppose it's defined for more less than delta by simply composing with, you know, if you want phi t between delta and 2 delta, you can take phi delta, compose with something between again 0 and delta and then you end up in something between 2 delta. So you can do repeat this and get defined for all. But in the case of uh, periodics you can't do that kind of thing. There is no way of the, you know, rear lines when ordered and uh, nicely ordered and so you could do that. But in the periodic cases you can't do that. But on the other hand the periodic cases, Monte is itself a loop. So it's a group of what different options are. Okay, in the both in the real case and the uh, PID case, if the manifold is compact, you get a whole group of different options of the manifold into itself. So phi t is called the local unparameter group <coughs> of X. Local one parameter group of local diffeomorphisms, local analytic diffeomorphisms. of x. 
the doctor field gives rise to. Conversely, of course, if, if you had a, a family of functions phi t like this, you can define the vector field by this formula. So it goes both ways. If you have local or parameter group of local diffusion organisms, such as a bunch, a mapping phi capital phi like satisfying these conditions, then this makes perfect sense and that will give you a vector field. So there is a bijective correspondence between vector fields and local one parameter group, local diffusion organisms. <coughs> If M is compact and K periodic, phi T goes from M to M, this collection, mod T less than delta, gives the group homomorphism. from <coughs> x mod x x in k mod x less than delta which is a group because <coughs> of the ultra metric inequality it's a group into <coughs> automorphisms or diffeomorphisms of M into itself. All analytic automorphisms of M we form a group. From this group to this group we get a group homomorphism. <coughs> okay, once again, the proof is really the, it, this theorem is nothing but the existence of ordinary differential equations. What you do is to solve the following differential equation. You have to solve for phi t omega. You want it to be such that d by dt phi t omega can be in a, in a local chart, in a coordinate chart. Phi t omega looks like phi 1 t omega, phi 2 t omega, etc phi and t omega. In the interval of functions, phi is a mapping from omega into m. You use a chart, you, know, you can assume that your, your, your t is all going to be small so that everything happens inside the chart. So phi t omega becomes phi 1 t omega etc. phi and t omega. <coughs> and what do we want? Notice that this is a... <coughs> see, what do I mean by this? I, each of these can be considered as a function on the manifold. For a fixed t, I can consider it as a function on the manifold. Or if you like, I can consider it as a manifold as a function on the uh, mod t less than delta cross open set Euclidean space. Because I am well working inside a coordinate chart, everything is happening in Euclidean space. So, <coughs> what I want is, if I apply x to phi 1 t omega, This is nothing but x itself in the local coordinate system is going to look like ai d by instead of omega, let me write omega because I am using coordinate chart, so I will write omega for omega exponents to xn. So phi x phi i t exponents to xn. So what I am looking at. I want this to be the vector field x itself in the local chart it won't look like ai x d by dx i. So this is going to look like x <coughs> applied to phi t, t x is going to be sigma ai d by dx i ai x d by dx i. Applied to. Notice that I am going to apply x at. If I apply this, I take this point, phi of tx minus section, and apply x there, and I will then end up in ai of phi 
dx d phi i dx1 subtraction x applied to this is equal to this on the other uh, <coughs> sorry no, no sorry x applied to this is simply this sorry when I say the vector field is a i d by d x i if I apply it to the ith coordinate I am going to get the coefficient a i so x Apply to phi i dx, this is the ith coordinate. I'm going to get at, at the point the ith coordinate, the point t x1 fraction. So I'm going to get this as the expression for x phi i. x phi i is equal to this. Sorry, x phi i is equal to this. But then I want x phi i also to be equal to d by dt of the ith coordinate of phi dx so I am looking at the functions phi 1, phi 2, phi l of t I am going to treat x as a parameter for each fixed x I get a differential equation in phi 1, phi 2, phi l as x varies, I get a family of differential equations like a family parameterized by x. And this equation is what I want to solve with some initial value, namely when I put t equals 0, I am going to get ki of phi 0 x equals d by dt of phi. So I am solving an initial value problem for normal differential equation with analytic coefficients, depending on a parameter. And a standard theorem in differential equations tell you that this has an analytic solution, unique analytic solution, depending also on the parameter analytically. So the existence theorem for ordinary differential equations yields this result in general. Okay. Again, it's a I'm waiting for analytic differential equations. How do I prove the theorem? Assume that there's a power series, make an expansion. Write to, to write the two sides and equate coefficients and prove convergence. You know all the power series involved are con convergent, and you have to see the new power series which you get out of all this is again convergent. This again a method of measurements. I don't want to go into it. I, I don't know where you will find the proof though. I think it's best for you to work out the proof yourself. There are easy proofs, but. Uh, uh, it's, it's not difficult. For the inverse function theorem itself, the inverse function theorem and the implicit function theorem are equivalent theorems, as you know. And for the implicit function theorem, as I said, you can find a proof in the simple case of two variables in Karta's book on complex variables using the method of measurements. And once you see the proof, these other proofs are even easier. You can always manipulate and get things out fairly easily. Okay, so this is an important theorem. So you when the, as I said, when the manifold is compact, you have a global own parameter group. In general, you have only local fetus, which are defined only in, on relatively compact sets. But when the whole manifold is compact, there's nothing to do. You are in good shape, and you really get a form model. And in the real case, in the real case, in the case of R or C, get Phi from <coughs> R or C into analytic automorphisms of yeah. In the case of R, it's uh, I already told you how to do it. You split R into uh, intervals of length delta, and then you can n delta can always be got by simply compos composing phi delta n times and then the rest is, is available composed with phi t 
for for t less than delta. Maybe it should work for delta too because it's defined for p t less than delta. So p delta itself is not defined, but p delta too is defined. You can work with work out that. Now, <coughs> on the other hand, for complex numbers, you have to essentially use the fact that complex numbers is simply correct. That if you look at the proof carefully, you will see that you need the fact that it is simply correct. Anyway, it is not. Uh, so what happens is, as you can, if you fix a line in, in the complex numbers, the real line, some are sitting inside C, then you can define it by the same process. But you want to define it for everything, and when you want to do that, you have to pay some attention. Simple connectivity of C is one way of doing it. Maybe this another method. If you find you don't use simple connectedness, you should be happier. You can. These are things which you can work out, and you ought to work out. <coughs> Okay, so that is uh, the theorem about one parameter groups, local one parameter groups, or even global ones when the manifold is compact. And there are other situations even when the manifold is not compact, when the vector field generates a global one parameter group. You will see such examples presently. I'll come to that. When I say global, I mean either this, this is not quite global, this is global in the sense that everywhere on M, but not everywhere on K. Only in small portion in K, but periodic fields are very accommodating. Even small neighborhoods are groups, so we don't have to worry too much about composition not being defined in some portion of the. Okay, now <coughs> let's get down to Lie groups. What? Yeah, before I put Lie groups, let me point out one other thing. In some sense, it is in the Lie group. Look at R n and look at d by d x one. What is the one parameter group for d by d x one? D by d x one is a vector field. It should have one parameter group. What is the vector field? So, what is the one parameter group? So, for each t, I have to give you a different different of some t from R n to R n. This is nothing but take a vector x and add x goes to t plus If I take d by d x i, for instance, i this vector x plus t here. In other words, I am adding t to the i coordinate and nothing to others. It's easy to see that this is due to the partial differential of d by d x. So this is the one parameter. And it turns out you can say something very nice. If you have a vector field which is at one point, suppose it's not zero, x m. If a vector field at every point you get a tangent vector, some place it can be zero a priori. But suppose it's not zero at a certain point, then in a neighborhood there is a coordinate system in which the vector field simply becomes d by d x one. So this, if you like, I'll say it again, sir. Here, the text be a vector field on the analytic manifold. Yeah. <coughs> Then and m in m be such that x m is not zero. The tangent vector is not zero. Then <coughs> there exists a coordinate chart. F with M in U such that in U x equals d by d x. What? Everywhere in U. If you like x m prime is d by d x one at m prime for every m prime. Vector field, vector field d by d x everywhere. And if you do that, it's clear. I mean, of course, one deduces it by using the one parameter group of x. Obviously, but if the other way around, it's if you if you can do that, then of course you can get non parameter because we know what the one parameter group of d by d x one is. So the proof I'm going to leave it as an exercise. Use us 
inverse function theorem. For inverse function theorem, which are the two things are the same. It's a good exercise. Use inverse function theorem. Roughly speaking, I give you a rough idea of how the thing goes. So you have this point M here, and you have coordinates in the vector field x is not zero. So there is some direction like this, which corresponds to x. This is xm. In the, in the coordinate system, I, by making a linear change, I can assume the coordinate system. This is nothing but d by dx1 if you like. Then you take a plane perpendicular to that, to the x coordinate, coordinate take the other coordinates, then apply, take any point x <coughs> in the in this one time in the co-dimension one subspace, take any point x in the co x prime in the co-dimension one subspace, and then look at x prime uh, t going to phi t of x prime. X prime is in the hyperplane, one dimension less. And in the neighborhood always where phi t is defined. Look at this map. This gives you a mapping of open set in Rn minus 1 cross not a k minus 1 cross open set in k into K. Apply the inverse function theorem to the situation and you find you get a diffeomorphism of this product onto the image which is an open set. And now use these as coordinates rather than that. Then t is one of the coordinates and d by dt is the operation. So you can take t as the first coordinate x1 becomes d by dx1. That's the proof. I work it out. If you have not understood it, Think of think for yourself and get it out. So anyway, so this uh, theorem is interesting. Yeah, let me also make another statement which is interesting, which again I'm not really proof to you. But I can call it theorem again. If x m is zero, phi t of m equals m. Reality with mod t delta as in the so it remains always it fixes it fixes the point every element of the component group fixes the point m if the vector field is zero at that point if it's a fixed point it's clear that's what's happening the d by dt of f of f composed with phi t at m is what I am looking at and then it is clear if phi t fixes that value does not change so d by dt is 0. Okay. So it goes the other way around also and it is quite easy to prove so I leave the proof to you. So was, was Lee motivated by this differential equation that exists zero? Sorry? Was Lee motivated by this? I do not know if Lee, it might have been known even before Lee. The point is that you know this is a you know what they call autonomous systems, uh, dy by dx equals fy, x does not figure. Here, the x here is a parameter, remember. So it is only d phi by dt is d by dt of phi, is the kind of equation you get. And they are naturally, they come up all the time in mechanics. In fact, the standard uh, equations uh, in mechanics are equations of this kind, uh, especially when they are, uh, you know, when the force field depends only on the position of the vector and not on time. So you always get the velocity is going to be, the acceleration is going to be d square x by dt square is going to be some function of x, t does not go to figure. So that is the kind of differential equation you get. You know, the, I mean the whole uh, thing is inspired by mechanics really. So it goes back to maybe D'Alembert and such people. Okay, so one interesting thing that, that uh, 
happens about vector fields is the following. Suppose the x and y are two vector fields. Then if I take any function on m, if I take an analytic function defined on some open set, I apply x, xf will result in the analytic function in that open set. <coughs> Similarly yf. Now suppose f is an analytic function in omega open in m. Let's look at, I can apply y to f. So this is the analytic function again. This xf, yf are analytic functions in omega. By this I mean xf at m, if you like, is xm at f, on f. And similarly for y. So these are analytic functions now on the domain omega. I can now Therefore, I can differentiate this xf by y. I can look at x or yf by x. I can look at x by f and yxf also makes sense. It turns out if I look at the difference xyf minus yxf, this is usually denoted bracket xy on f. Now, this bracket xy on f, I can now look at the following situation. I look at ym m in omega then from this I get a mapping at m this is a fun so function defined in the neighborhood of m bracket x y f so I can evaluate it m that's an element in K. It turns out what you get this way is a vector field. That is, in other words, this XY FM, this is this mapping. This is a, this is a tangent vector. The mapping which takes YM with a function F in F going to. f going to bracket x y f m is the tangent vector. <coughs> which I will denote bracket x y m if you like. So bracket x y really becomes you get a new vector field out of X, x and y is bracket x. So why is it a vector field? This basically the point is this. Differentiating with respect to x if you like. It's like a first order differential operator. If you have a first order differential operator, two first order differential operators, take that product, you get a second order operator. And y, the other reverse direction also, you get if you take x, y and y, x, both give you second order operators. But the top degree terms of the two will be the same. Because what happens? What is a first order operator like? a times d by dx sigma a d by dx i the other one is sigma b sigma b i d by dx j d by dx i so you when you form the product you get a i b j d by dx i d by dx j and then other th other things you get i will differentiate a i b j one of the two but the top order terms with the root take a i b j d by dx i d by dx j or b j a i d by dx j d by dx i they cancel out because you d by dx and d by dx j commute so order does not matter so the top order terms cancel out you get all lower order terms which means you get a first order equation which means you only get a linear combination of differentiating once which is why what, what you get is the vector field you need two vector fields to get this bracket x y if you are just if x and y are defined at just one point, there is nothing you can do with them. You cannot manufacture a vector, tan, new tangent vector, two, two tangent vectors at a given point. But if you have a vector field, you do get a new vector field, bracket x, y. This is called the Poisson bracket 
bracket. It's not 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 called the Poisson bracket. It's, it's simply called the bracket. Okay. Some there's something else called the Poisson bracket. So I shouldn't confuse you. X X. So X Y going to bracket X Y is an operation called the bracket operation. This bracket has an interesting property. Firstly, has some interesting properties. One, bracket x x is zero. That's obvious. X y minus y x is x square minus x square. Secondly, if you have x three vector fields x y z. Bracket x y z plus bracket y z x plus bracket z x y is zero. You do this cyclically and add up; it becomes zero. That's an easy thing to check out. I will not go into the proof. It's easy to check this out. Thirdly. Lambda x y equals x lambda y equals lambda times bracket x y for lambda and k. Actually, you can multiply the vector field by scale. Obviously, to multiply the vector field by scale, you can do better. You can even multiply fun functions. But this operation is not bilinear over functions. It's only bilinear over k. When you Do something like this. If f is a function and you look at f x y, you obviously want to become f x y minus y f x, which will give you. <coughs> you can see. There's one term. This y f x. When you apply it to a function, you're going to. Differentiate with respect to x, then multiply by f, and then apply y. So you are going to get this equal to f x. I am keeping it as such. Minus y f into x plus sorry minus f y x. So you are going to get f of bracket x y with a correction factor minus y f x. Y f is a function, then multiplying by x. So it's not. If you multiply x by f, it doesn't come out. But there's a, it does come out, but there's a correction factor. Too. It doesn't work. <coughs> I mean, this is just the Leibniz formula. Being. So you have uh, the vector, vector fields on a manifold have these properties and the bracket operation. Now, this gave rise to the definition of a Lie algebra. The Lie algebra over a field K can also define it over a ring. This is the same kind of definition. The Lie algebra over a field. Here we don't need anything like evaluated field. Any field it makes sense. The field K is a K vector space. Equipped with a binary operation, K vector space. Let me give it a name. G, that is supposed to be German Gothic <coughs> G, equipped with a binary operation. G cross G to G. Denoted x y going to bracket x y, satisfying the first three equations. So it's capital K should be replaced with small k. That's all. One, two, and three with k in place of capital K. 
That's what Ali algebra is. This last one says it's bilinear. Oh, no, I'm not saying. Hey, I forgot. I should have added here. This should be 5. 4, which is obvious, is x, y plus z equals x, y plus x, z. And similarly, on the other side, but that will follow from the this implies you write bracket of x plus y, x plus y is 0, then you get that equation bracket x y equal to minus bracket y x. So all these equations should be satisfied 1, 2, 3, and 4. 1, 2, 3, and 4. That's what a Lie algebra is. So vector fields do form a Lie algebra, but they are infinite dimensional, and we will be, you, you, as you see the sequel, interested in finite dimensional Lie algebra. They come up in the context of regroups in a very natural fashion. Okay, so. <coughs> This is the all right <clears throat> now. So that's the definition of Lie algebra. And now I, I want to define a Lie group for you. What I'm going to tell you is that given a Lie group, there is a natural finite dimensional Lie algebra associated to it. If the Lie group is a manifold of dimension n, the Lie algebra is going to be a vector space of dimension n. It's a finite dimensional Lie algebra. How does one get a Lie algebra from a Lie group? It's the question. So let me begin with the Lie group G. Order than Kn of dimension and C. We have the identity element one in G. That's the notation for identity element. Or sometimes I may also use U C or 1. Look at the tangent space at the identity. Let's let me for the right tangent space I prefer to E U C. T E is a tangent space to G at E. That's the finite dimensional vector space of dimension exactly equal to m. Now suppose v is a vector in t, tangent vector in E. Let us look at the map g to g, fix, fix an element g in g and let us look at the translation, left translation map which is an analytic map of g to g. This is the map Lg on h is g times h. It's an analytic map. Therefore, the differential of LG is it, an analytic diffeomorphism because LG inverse is the inverse of LG. And both are analytic maps. One is the inverse of the other, so it's an analytic diffeomorphism. Therefore, if I look at the ta tangent map BLG, <coughs> look at the tangent at the point G inverse. To G, but I translate by G on the left, G inverse goes to identity. So this will go into TG, TE, G. So, and this is an isomorphism because this is an analytic diffeomorphism, there is also an inverse. So here is a vector V here. I can pull it back by this map. So it D L G inverse of V makes sense. This is an element in T G inverse G. 
So for every g, I have a tangent vector at the point g inverse by this formula, by this recipe. Or I could have taken it, I could have looked at, looked at dlg going from teg to tgg and then the image, the two things are the same essentially. So what you find is this, to each g, I am able to give an assignment to each point g in g, I am able to assign a tangent vector at that point. To each g in g, get tangent vector, let me call it L sub g v in T G of G. Right. In fact, I probably should have done it that way. T E G will E will go to G here in the T G. So D L G of V is what I've called yeah, I'll also call it L G V or simply V G. So with an assignment G going to be and because it is a very natural way in which all this is done, it is easy to reach, it is an analytic vector field. It is called left translation invariant analytic vector field given by the vector v at the tangent space to the identity, at the tangent space to g at identity. So each v in Tg in, in Te gives rise to a vector field which is left translation invariant in the sense whenever an analytic diffeomorphism obviously you can take vector fields to vector fields such an analytic diffeomorphism takes vector fields to vector fields because at every time every time vector there is an image transfer vector. So and if you do two distinct points are taken to different points so there will be no confusion. If you have vector field here it goes to the vector field. So what this means is dlg say so x is left translation invariant means dlg of x equals x. The induced map at the vector field level takes x into itself for every g and g. Because all the group operands are analytic, it's quite easy to see that this left invariant vector field which you get is necessarily analytic. So for every vector in the ta tangent space at identity, you get a left invariant vector field. Obviously, on the other hand, given a left invariant vector field, it determines the tangent vector of the identity, and if you translate that, you get back that vector field, obviously. So there's a bijective correspondence, an isomorphism if you like, between the vector space of left invariant vector fields on G and the tangent space to identity at of G. So vector space. of left invariant vector fields, left translation invariant vector fields is in bijective correspondence with the tangent space of the identity. Now I want to say that the bracket operation preserves left invariance. That is if x and y are two vector fields, bracket x y is again left invariant easy to check and I will leave it to you. The bracket operations after all can be thought of as the differential operator xy minus yx. The differential operator xy itself will be left invariant in the obvious sense and so so also y, yx so the difference is again left translation invariant. So the set of left in vector this set is stable under bracket operation. So in fact, it's, it's a B algebra in its own right. It's a B sub algebra if you like, 
of the real algebra of all vector fields. All vector fields are enormous vector spaces, it's infinite dimensional. Inside that, you have the linear vector fields, which turns out to be stable under the bracket operation. And because the bracket operation has all the properties you want on all vector fields, it has the same properties on the subfield, so it's a Lie algebra. So what you get is a finite dimensional Lie algebra. So this Lie algebra is called the Lie algebra of the Lie group G. And I'm going to denote it by Lie G. Lie algebra of left translation invariant vector fields on G. Sometimes I also use in German Gothic lower case G <coughs> for denoting the real algebra. Both these notations are used. It's a finite dimensional Lie algebra. The interesting thing is this Lie algebra carries practically all the information you want about the Lie group. And what happens is this the Lie algebra is form a category, you know, all Lie algebra morphisms as Lie algebra homomorphisms. The Lie groups form a category in the world, right? And that's that what you get is a natural functor from the category of Lie groups into the category of Lie algebras. This functor is pr almost faithful. I mean, practically all information about the group can be gathered by applying the functor, going to Lie algebras and getting it. Not quite, not everything, but practically everything can be obtained. So that is why Lie algebras become very important. And Lie algebras are somewhat more easy to study because what the structure you have is a bilinear structure on G. Whereas group structures are, can, can be complicated, it's very difficult to get hold of them. But Lie algebra structures are easy to understand, easier to understand in any case. And so the study of Lie algebra gives you lots of information about Lie groups. In fact, Lie groups are studied ma mainly through their Lie algebra, which is what we do. <coughs> so this is the so the assignment G to Lie G. It's a functor from the category of Lie groups. The objects are Lie groups and morphisms are analytic homomorphisms. Into the category of finite dimensional Lie algebra. Okay. Into the category of finite dimensional Lie algebra. Actually, it turns out one of the reasons why it's a uh, nice functor is that every finite dimensional Lie algebra does correspond to your Lie group. Given a finite dimensional Lie algebra OK, there is a Lie group OK of which it is the Lie algebra. It's isomorphic to the Lie algebra group. So, which is why the information can be considered reasonably complete. <coughs> but there are delicate questions sometimes which you can settle with Lie algebra, but the corresponding Lie groups, the corresponding statements may be a little more subtle. You will not change things. It doesn't complete, doesn't give complete information, but quite a lot of information. I already gave you some examples. The, all the examples of Lie groups I gave were subgroups of JLN or its subgroups, basically. What are their Lie algebra? I will list the Lie algebra of these Lie groups presently. So here is G and Lie G. <coughs> here <coughs> the Lie group is GLN, K. The Lie algebra is MN K. Bracket operation is MN K is a associative algebra, and then you can form AB minus BA in the associative algebra. That is the bracket. AB going to AB minus BA is the bracket operation which you can check satisfies the identities we want. <coughs> this is one. The next one I gave is SL and K. Here it is X and M and K. 
with trace x 0. S and K by definition is something with determinant 1 and the infinite version of determinant is a trace so to speak. We look at the determinant map at the identity and calculate its tangent map. Determinant of the map from GLN to K can calculate the tangent map at identity that serves out to the trace map. 3. I had uh, the group SOF corresponding to the form sigma xi square the orthogonal group here it is skew-symmetric matrices of course uh, the first example is Rn the Lie algebra is nothing but Rn with zero operation trivial operation any two brackets are zero and that is how, do, how does one prove this? If you look at, now in the case of Rn, the vector fields are nothing but D, the invariant vector fields, D by Dx1 is the invariant vector field, translation invariant. So D by Dx1, D by Dx2, D by Dxn, they are all the invariant vector fields. And they all commute. So the bracket operands are zero. They, they span the whole Lie algebra and they all commute. So bracket is zero. For Rn, Lie algebra. And let me give one example of the group which I did not give last time. We can look at the upper triangular group. The star in K. This is in the subset of GL and K. And it's the the back turns out to be the upper triangular matrices with zero on the diagonal, which is stable in the bracket, as you can see. upper triangles with 0 on the diagonal that's the Lie algebra okay. <coughs> a particular case which is of uh, considerable importance uh, as one of the building blocks is a so called Heisenberg algebra which is the case n equals 3 so you get So three dimensional Lie algebra looks like this zero. It's called the Heisenberg algebra and it has an important role to play in physics. The corresponding group is the upper triangle group in three variables, in three cross three matrices. It's called the Heisenberg group. Named after the physicist Heisenberg. Because he really put it to great use in quantum mechanics. <coughs> See if you look at the operations uh, d by dx and x d by dx the bracket is the identity in finite if you take finite finite dimensional matrices finite, random options of finite dimensional vector space the bracket of two operations two matrices can never be identity because the trace of bracket of anything is zero whereas the trace of identity is not zero we are all, always working with characteristic zero anyway but if you look at the operation by multiplication by x and d by dx look at the bracket you end up in identity. That's easy to check. And uh, this Lie algebra is of uh, considerable importance in quantum mechanics. Well, that's a Lie group, right? Hmm? Yeah, that's a Lie group. What's the corresponding? Oh, the Lie algebra consists of, uh, yeah. As I said, think of x, d by dx, and identity. That gives you three dimensional algebra. The bracket of these two is this these to commute with that. So it's a three-dimensional three Lie algebra. That is you have uh, basic elements x, y, z, the bracket of x, y, z and z is central. Those are the bracket operations. Okay, I think I've just at 5 o'clock and 5.30 and I should stop. <laughs>